name, Father God, the great of mercy. Father God, we come to you, praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for this day, Father God. We just thank you for the opportunity. And I pray that we continue in our thought process of being thankful. Just not once a year, Father God. Let us truly be thankful for everything going on in our lives, everything we have, Father God. I just thank you for your blessings. I love you, dear God. Amen. Amen.
you our hearts, our energy. We thank you for everything that you've done. And we thank you for all that you're going to do. We give you this time right now.
There's Jews, there's people from all over, there's Egyptians, there's people from everywhere living in Corinth, right? And so with all of this commerce, it's a worldly city. Matter of fact, the, the term Corinth was a, a slang that they used to throw around. They would call other people as you're becoming Corinth. It's a place of worldliness. It's a place of immorality. It's a place where people live loosely and fast. So, and obviously, when that happens in society, what happens in the church? Y'all can talk back. It's okay. It's just nine o'clock. <laughs> what? It seeps in. Our culture, our surroundings seemingly seep into the church. You had a bad attitude this morning? You brought it into the church. It seeped into the church by you. You lazy? Seeped into the church by you. You, you, you just a, a critical spirit seeped into the church by you. You got joy seeps into the church. You got understanding seeps into the church. You got spiritual gifts seeps into the church. You love the Lord and love others, it seeps into the church. So what you have in your life, it's going to seep into the church. Just like you have in your everyday life, it seeps into your marriage. It seeps into your job. It seeps into your kids. Stop blaming everybody else. It's on you. Whatever happens, if your job sucks, and I use the word sucks in church, because you use far worse. You think far worse. Come on. It's maybe an attitude that you carry into the job that you have that you hate so much. Yeah, the job may be terrible, and bosses sometimes are not the best to deal with, but it's how we deal with how we carry ourselves into that place is how we what happens when we walk out of that place. That's right. Same way the church. It's the same way in Corinth. They were living fast and loose and it was infecting the church. It was like an open wound seeping into the church. Never being able to close it. And the Apostle Paul said, this is a problem. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. And so I'm going to address it. I'm going to deal with church divisions, and I'm going to take four chapters to do it, and then I'm going to deal with moral failures. And I'm going to take two chapters to do it, but here's the reality. Paul didn't break them up into chapters. He just wrote until he felt he was done and stopped. Amen. Right? We broke it down into chapters to make it easier to read, okay, and easier to understand, yeah. right? And the Bible's not even in chronological order. I have a chronological Bible. My mom likes to read in chronological order, so she herself one, and I have one. I have to put it on the shelf because it's so difficult as you get set in your ways to read things in, chrono in, in chronological order because then you get ahead of yourself. Well, it says this, and, and, and <laughs> it says this in Genesis, but why, or this in Exodus. So we all have got to get in our mind that that commercial, or excuse me, not commercial trades, that Corinth, um, in that city, they decided to have a temple built, and, and it started... It was a place, honestly, of bold idolatry, bold immorality, set aside and called it a place of worship. So the place of worship that, that they built and set aside, it was, it was a place uh, for the goddess of love, Aphrodite. And so in this place, they had over a thousand <laughs> temple prostitutes. Now you tell me if that place was set aside to worship God. Or honor the flesh. It was a place for the flesh. Right? Say right. Amen. And when you when I'm talking about maintaining the house of God, maintaining the church, caring for the church, I'm not talking about this building. And you'll see as we dive into this scripture today that we're not talking about a place like the temple of, of Aphrodite or Aphrodite. Aramaeus or anything like that. It's, it's simply a place where we come to worship, honor, adore a holy God Amen. and take ourselves out of the equation. So as you can see, the church at Corinth faced many difficulties and had a ton of challenges and extremely huge obstacles to overcome to get to where they needed to be with God in their lives. So Paul dealt with, it, dealt with it, and he dealt with it prevalently. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where I'll just read it to you, you can write it down. Verse 1, the Apostle Paul says this, 
it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And then the last part of chapter 6, verse 13, listen to what he says. Now the body is not for fornication. We need that to read that again in America. Amen. For the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So you've got to admit that the culture that we live in today closely resembles that of Corinth. Is that right? I mean, they were so bold with it that they, they built a temple, and in that temple, they had a thousand prostitutes. Hmm. Now think about this. Tell me how one-sided that house of worship was for men. Where could the women go and worship? Well, I got a secret for you. The women went to the house of God probably if they were not running and partaking in fornication and idolatry and immorality and every kind of sin under the sun. It's no wonder that the churches today in America and mostly across the world are built up of godly women and there's a few straggling men out there trying to do their best to glorify God and the rest of the men are out there doing whatever in the world they want to do. That's right. Let's look at verse 19 in chapter 6. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Apostle Paul here is talking about the opportunities of the body. Now, he reminds us the importance and the significance of the human body. He, he's well aware that there is a lot going on and there's a lot of things that are challenging to them in their lives. But he's saying, I want you to use your body in the right way when it comes to God and the righteous standard of living. So I want to approach this subject with you about your, the opportunities of your body. Do you know that we have uh, certain opportunities with our bodies? Did you know that? Say amen. amen. We, we do. Now, let me say up front, I'm not considering or encouraging that, that, that we go and do crazy stuff with, with our bodies or within our bodies. What I'm telling you is simply this. With our bodies, we have an opportunity to sin. Why? Because we are the flesh. Now, I've been saved since 1992, been born again since 1992, and wavered much in my walk with God. And you think by now that I'm grown up in my faith, but the reality is, even though I've been a born again Christian since 1992, I still have opportunities to sin. I have to choose every day if I'm going to reject sin and accept God. I have to choose that every single day. And so do you. We all have the opportunity to sin. So when I was saved, the Lord saved me spiritually. But he didn't save my flesh. Because the reality is my flesh is going to be shed off when I meet him face to face. I'm going to get a new body. Come on. So I have to choose. To put off fleshly things. Amen. In order to deny my body and my flesh the opportunity to sin and accept <laughs> and welcome the opportunity and the blessing, the anointing of God to enter. We have to welcome him. We have to accept him. Sin, we don't have to welcome it or accept it. It's just there. We have, the, the Bible simply says we have to resist it. Amen. The reason the Bible says, y'all, the Bible's written in such a way that we should be able to, we should sit back and go, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He simply says you resist it. Why? Because it's there. That's right. God knew that sin is always going to abound. That's, right. That's why he says resist it. You've got to work. I want Christianity to be easy. I want my bills to be paid. Christianity is not easy. Amen. It's a difficult task because we're surrounded by sin. We're surrounded, and he calls this in the Old Testament, he 
call sin weight. He says to shed off the weight yeah. that so easily throws you off course. Amen. It's, he knows that you're carrying sin with you because that's what our bodies are full of. And then he says something that is incredible. I love that he says, know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Thank God our bodies as children are occupied by the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, we're surrounded by sin. Yes, we are encamped by sin. Yes, sin is all around us, pressuring us and, and hammering us and hindering us all day long. But we have someone that has occupied us. Amen. It's the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. You like it. You probably people call him the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God. Spirit of man. I mean, everything. And I don't care what it is. I got Jesus living in me Amen. in spirit form. So we have an opportunity to sin. So if you ever get to the place that you feel like you can, that you can handle your sin, you're in a dangerous place. That's right, God. You ever get to the place in your life where you feel like sin is not that big of a deal? You are treading on thin ice. Because I'm telling you, one of these days, that crack is going to get larger, and it's literally going to bust wide open, and it's going to swallow you whole. Do not tread in sin. Matter of fact, the Word of God says it this way. He says, do not give place to the devil. Let me tell you why he says don't, don't give place to the devil. He, you, you ever heard? This is where the old statement, the statement comes. You, 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 you take an inch. Give them high. It's where it comes from. So the truth of the matter is, if we tread in sin eventually, it's going to swallow us whole. Amen. So don't play with sin. If I said you play with fire, what would you say? Burn. Get burnt. That's the reality of sin. So we have an opportunity to sin. But we also have an opportunity for sanctification. Did you notice that? Look at, look at verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth with his body, or is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. So you might ask, how in the world is this possible? How in the world can, can we sin in the body? Well, look, this is what they set aside a thousand prostitutes. They weren't there for counseling and holding hands. Not for men with mommy complexes or women with daddy complexes. They were there to blatantly sin against God. So there's an opportunity. And he said, flee fornication. Let me just say it this way. If you find yourself in a tempting situation where we fear that we're going to give in to sin, run. Amen. Run. Get away from it. Build barriers in your life. Put safeguards there where you won't sin. And it don't just have to be with opposite sex when it comes to fornication. It can literally be anything. If you have a problem with taking things that are not yours, put safeguards in place that will keep you from making that, that decision to sin and take something that is not yours. Lying, falsely accusing, gossiping, slandering, Committing libel. We do that every day in the church, every day in our lives, at our kitchen tables. We don't need the kitchen table anymore, do you? You sit in front of the television, we get to a TV tray. So wherever you're sitting, we sit there and we, at work, we, we literally give ourselves opportunity after opportunity to engage in sin. Why? Because it's there. And by goodness, I'm good at it. There's a lot of people good at sin. A lot of people good at a lot of things. I'm going to let you in on the secret. We're all good at sin. We all have a sin that we pet and we love and we care for. And we'll put it on the shelf and it'll be there when I need it. You better figure out a way to get that thing down and present it to God. Do you know that God loves for you to present your sin to him as an offering? He wants you to give it to him. Amen. That's why he says, cast all your cares on me. All your burdens on me. Give them to him. 
He literally welcomes it. You know why he welcomes it? He ain't going to keep it. He says, I'll throw it as far as the east is to the west. Amen. Never to remember it anymore. Not only am I going to forgive you of it, I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to, to stand in that place to be a barrier. I always tell Bailey, or I told Bailey, and I've told Haley before, you go out on a date, put a King James 1611 Bible in, in the, top of the middle of you and your date, and people crawl over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't need him. Right? The Holy Spirit becomes a barrier for us in our lives. Here's what we don't know. Ask yourself this question. Let's talk for a minute. Ask yourself this question. The sin that you love committing, you know you love it. Don't you lie to yourself because you know what you enjoy. Overindulge on some too strong, too strong to drink. I'm not saying you can't drink. I'm saying you get to the point where you go, I probably don't need to drink another one. Because if I drink another one, I'm going to get turned, and everybody in this place is going to know I'm hammered. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Drink a bottle of Right? Stop right there. Simply say, God, I need to put you in this place. When I get to the point that I want to go too far, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to just nudge me. And then if I don't accept that nudge, then you beat my eyeballs. Amen. When you get to the point that you're going to sin and you know you shouldn't be lying and you're flowing with a great story and everything up until that point is wonderfully true. And you start to get to that point, you go, ooh, this is good that I've got them. They're captivated. I'm going to go ahead and stretch this little story right here. And tell something else. Don't act like y'all ain't never done that. That's right. You put God in that place. Because even a story that is presented as truth and you know it's a lie, I'm telling you, even if they're laughing and they're eating it up and they're soaking it up, it is sin against the holy God. Yeah. So when we get to the place that we know that we have a problem, and I tell you, if you're a child of God, you know when you have a problem. So we have opportunities to sin. And there are so many sins that I could preach on points and subpoints and topics and subtopics that I could throw in here today that we'd be here all day talking about the one opportunity to sin and nothing else. And aren't you glad that we have a time in the world? So I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about the, op the occupation of the body. What is the body for? Look at verse 19. One more time. What? No, they... Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost within you, which you have of God, listen to what he says here, and you are not your own. Amen. The body is not to be occupied with sin. It's to be occupied with the Holy Ghost. They, we have a resident living within us. If you're an honorable person, and let me throw that in here for those watching at home. I believe everybody in this room is. I don't know all of you by name at home, but I'm going to go ahead and take, go out on a limb because I, I know a lot of people that own homes. If you are a, a, an honorable person, if you rent somebody's home, you're going to take care of that home. And when you leave that home, and they walk in, they're going to be able to tell their cleaning crew, don't come to the house because it's ready to be occupied by somebody else. We have the Holy Spirit of God occupying our bodies. He is there to help us clean and straighten up the house that he occupies. Amen. When we go into somebody's home and we're renting that home, we have the responsibility to help maintain and care for that home. Just as a honorable person would do that, the Holy Spirit of God is here ready and willing. He's got the Windex in one hand, the clay in the other hand, the vacuum with his toes. He's ready to get to clean. But he's got to have the owner of that home to say the resident can clean it up. Right. Clean it up, Holy Spirit. Clean up my body. Clean up my, my life. Clean up my mind. I am not my own anymore. You live here now. Amen. The God that you know sin now occupies a house that is full of it. 
ready to rid our lives of sin. Amen. We just have to let the resident clean us up. I want him to clean me up. Amen. I need the cleansing of the Holy Spirit of God. This sanctuary that we live in, listen, let me tell you something. This, this, or excuse me, this sanctuary that we worship in, the other one that we go and worship in, does not occupy the Holy Spirit of God. It's just set aside to worship and honor Him. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We take the Holy Spirit with us. There's no Holy Ghost meeting going on in that church when nobody's there. There's no shout. There's no amen. There's no song. There's no worship. There's no honor. There's no sacrifice. There's nothing going on when we're not here. But when one person comes in this place, it becomes the house of God set aside to worship God. No matter what you're doing in this place. We are the body. We are the temple of God. We have the ability to choose to worship Him, honor Him, or not. Amen. Amen. You know what we do, or what we should do? We should rely on the Holy Spirit. Amen. We should have a reliance on Him. God, I, I, I know better than to think this or to say this. But I'm asking you to cleanse my thoughts, occupy my mind, guard my tongue. That's all Scripture, by the way. I'm asking you to do it. Because if I do it, I'm going to mess it up. That's why when we pray, we go down there and we start praying for natural, if we're really praying, by the way, if we're truly praying, we'll come down here with natural words and we'll begin to pray. But before we know it, Holy Spirit has taken over. Because he says, you don't know what you need. I'm here. I see it. I know what you got me doing. And I'll talk to him on your behalf. I'm just going to use your lips to do this. <laughs> Amen? Boy, boy, that's what you better. Get some golden nuggets. Y'all ain't even saying amen on them things. I think I thought some of these one liners would kill. <laughs> Man. I thought Miss Faye go home and get her hot friends making t shirts. <laughs> well, there she got a real good one. They checked that one out before you leave. Pretty good. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? You know, we've been given the greatest blessing. Other than salvation we could ever get. Holy Ghost. Amen. Living there. Occupied us. So when we're tempted to live in a way or a manner. That we know is displeasing to the Lord. We've got to understand he's given us the Holy Spirit of God for us to give. And rely on him every day. You're not going to do it on your own. Verse 18 talks about something that's pretty awesome. He says, you're not your own. You see it? You're not your own. So what is he talking about here? He's saying that we need to practice restraint. That we need to practice restraint. The Corinthians, uh, as, as well as believers today, have been forced to deal with the issue of purity and maintaining the body. In, in this life that we live in today, people are no longer satisfied and with they want indulgence. I want everything. And when it comes to the flesh, it's insane what we see today. I try to go back in my mind as a eight, nine, ten year old boy. And what was on our television versus what's on it now. And I cannot fathom, because eight, before 8 o'clock, nothing really inappropriate as far as showing stuff of the body was allowed on television. And then after 8, you know, Dynasty came on, and, and uh, what's that other one? Dynasty came on, Dynasty came on, then Dynasty came on at 9. Dynasty was a little more risque than Dallas. Oh, hey, or help us. We don't even get into that. That's what the world lost. Went to hell in the ambassador, yeah. right? <laughs> but I try to think about that, and there, I can't comprehend. I don't, our kids grow up with it like this. It's, it's there immediately. They literally can top in 
one word on Instagram, I mean, or they can even type in a half of a word that they're not even trying to spell, and something come up on their store or story that their search that they're not looking for, and it's all about sex. Every one of them. It's all about body image. Can you imagine as a kid in the 70s or in the 60s how that would have affected you? Can you imagine if it was there? Well, we've got to resist it. Even more so today. Finally, we've got to get to the place where we understand that there is an obligation to the body. Look at verse 20. For you bought the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Listen to what he says. Listen to this. Which are God's. Amen. He's simply saying which belongs to God. Right. You're not your own anymore. Who do you belong to? You belong to God. Some of us are going to present our bodies to him, and he's going to go, this trading value is jacked up. You ain't getting nothing for this thing. What if, what if our trading value based, was based off of our holy living? What if when he comes to give us a new body, just like you go get your new car, he says, okay, that new body, that new body is going to depend on the trading value of your body. Think about this because he says, present yourself to him, holy and acceptable and pleasing. What are we presenting to him? What are we laying down to him? There is a price that is to be paid, and that price was paid on Calvary. The price was paid on Calvary. The price, the price was for us not to be our own anymore, to be bought with a price. Now it's time for me to glorify God in my body, which is my reasonable act of service. My job now is no longer to please my flesh. It's to please a holy God that bought it and paid for it, and now he occupies it. So the purchase was paid on Calvary. We've been bought. You see verse 20? We've been bought with a price. The price was the life of the Lord Jesus. All right. That was the price. It was paid. And he says you're not your own. Why am I not my own anymore? Because I bought you back. That's right. You became a slave to sin. And you didn't even know it. Yeah. And I bought you back. Yeah. And now you are marked by the master. The king. And I've given you something that you don't even know. What is that? I'm glad you asked. It's a purpose. We all have a purpose in the body. For your body, the Christ therefore glorified God in your body. In your body and in your spirit. You notice what the verse said? We're to glorify God in our Body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we realize that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we look at ourselves and listen, you need to understand that as you look in that mirror, you're not looking at you. You're looking at the body of Christ. Amen. You're looking at the body that Jesus bought and paid for. Why would God want this ready? Tore up, battered, sickly little thing. Because he loves you. Amen. It's not really what you present on the outside. It's what occupies you on the inside. And a lot of people think when you die, you just stop to be. No, nothing could be further from the truth. You either really begin to live or you really begin to die when you lay down this life purpose is to glorify God in every facet of our life. Every day life. Present your body. Here's, here, let me put it in, 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 in some easy terms to understand. He's simply saying this. Every day that you live, 
Present yourself as if you're saved. Every situation that you get into, present yourself as if you're saved. Why? Because you are. And you're not your own anymore. Who are you presenting to people? Jesus. You're simply presenting one of two things. You're presenting evil, selfishness, pride, arrogance. You're presenting the enemy or you're presenting holiness, which is the Lord Jesus. That's why we talk about it for the last five weeks is choose you this day. You've got to choose who you're going to present in every situation in our lives. And so do I. And I choose to present him. Oh, we're going to have moments where we get frustrated and lash out. I did last night. I, I said one sentence, not to Ellie, but I said one sentence that I thought, oh, please let me have it. The reality is, I said and I instantly regretted it. Why? Because I'm not my own anymore. That's right. It didn't please the Holy Spirit. And when you get things out of whack, you ever ate something that didn't agree with you? Amen. And your body goes, this thing's supposed to be happening. <laughs> That's what happens when you sin as a child of God. The Holy Spirit gets out of whack and says, this thing's supposed to be happening. So you're going to fail. I'm not telling you you're not, but I'm telling you you don't have to live in failure. Thank you, Jesus. Come out from among them. Yeah. Be separate, says the Lord. Wow. Come out. Amen? Amen? I love it when I see people lay hands on people and say, come out! <laughs> I don't know if it works or not. I need to try it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so, amen. I'm like, come out! Church, don't you want to see a movement of God? Yeah. Hold on, hold on. I, 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 listen, if you can't see a movement in your life, don't expect to see one in the church. That's right. That's right. The preacher and the worship team can only take you so far. The Sunday school teachers, the messages preached in you can only take you so far. You've got to make a decision. You get on fire for God, it seeps into the church. Isn't that funny how that works? It's funny how that works. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all need to be like thaw out ice cream. You ever had ice cream? You freeze and stop working? You had a whole thing of ice cream in there and in those cartons. Remember those old old cartons, those cube cartons? I remember this because it happened in our house. I remember it. My mom's house, we had vanilla, always had vanilla ice cream in those little boxes and, and cardboard pump and put it up there on the very top shelf of our, our, our little refrigerator. And I remember coming home and, and the power had been off, off the parents since uh, the day before and I came home from Marty's house and I said, well, I'm going to give you some ice cream. Not thinking the power's off because I'm a dummy. And Charlotte said, because I was drunk. No. no. <laughs> oh, drink. Oh, see, you said drink. It's because you drink. I didn't know. <laughs> you know. You know my life. I'm right, sorry. I just... <laughs> and I come on and I open that thing up and, 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 and somebody, probably me, but I blame it on my sister, see how that works, turned it upside down because there's, there's a, a way that you open this thing on the side, right? And everything in that freezer was covered, was sticky. Like there's nothing you could pull out that didn't have that substance on it, all of it. Some of us need to be like melted ice cream. When you come into the house of God, you ought to just seep out all over everybody. And they say, I can't get this off of me. Good. Because when you get the Holy Spirit of God all on you, you don't want him gone. Amen. Amen. I got some more stuff I want to preach. I really want to preach. I need to preach. I want to so bad. So y'all come to town and get part two. I'm going to preach. And I love this church. I was so excited when I got up this morning and was able to, to get in the car and head down here. I mean, nothing I love more than coming right here to this church that I've been able to bless to preach at for a long time. And I, and I pray that I, I don't want to die in this pulpit, but I pray that when I die, I'm still preaching in this pulpit. But not, you understand what I'm saying. God, God loves me. 
heard a guy say, the reason I'm saying I heard a guy say that, and, and a couple weeks later, a dude died in the pulpit. Nah, I want that. <laughs> I don't want to put that on y'all. Too heavy. Y'all drag out of here. Y'all better call Jim Brown. <laughs> but I want to ask you, this is an invitation today. I want to ask you to come, and I want you to pray that God will do this very work in your life. I'm not saying you have thousands of prostitutes and that you're a fornicator. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm, but you're close. I, I'm, I'm simply saying that we all have places and things in our lives that we need God to clean. Amen. Amen. So would you come this morning?